I started with Sloan Miyasato when I used to work with Sheila Sloan. And um, she was an extraordinary woman and is an extraordinary showroom. So before I officially start my talk, I want to share a few stories to tell you a bit about myself. And um, as some of you may know, I am the millennial term, I suffer from FOMO, fear of missing out. <laughs> I was born this way, I can't help it. I have always felt like there is not enough time in the day, and there are so many places to see in the world, and so much to learn, and do, and be a part of. It is very hard for me to slow down and to be still, which can actually take a toll on our health and well-being. And it's one of the reasons why I care so deeply about this topic. I also had a recent experience in January at, Para, in, uh, at Deco Off in Paris, which some of you may have been there. Um, if you know when you're there, you run full speed. It's pretty intense. And um, there are all the wonderful showrooms. And the San Francisco Design Center and some of the showrooms here are really a big part of it. And I um, want to thank them, actually, if any of them are here, that they really put out for the designers and make it an extraordinary experience. I shared a, an apartment with Lori Weitzner, who I think some of you may know. Um, she's one of my personal heroes. She's one of the color gurus of our profession. And she had the press coming to the apartment we were sharing. And we wanted it to be a very special experience for them. And we happened to have this amazing piano in our apartment, which we didn't know about when we rented it. And we thought, oh, let's find a piano player. And we um, found a piano player. And we said, why don't you choose a song? And he kind of came in and walked around and kind of checked out the apartment and looked at Lori's presentation she was going to give to the press. And he's not in our field. So he's, he's a musician, though, so he's an artist. And he said um, he had a song picked out. And he selected the song because of the way the room felt and the way Lori's collection felt. I thought it was amazing that the room and the fabrics gave him a certain feeling someone that we'd only just met. The press was told that the piano would be played for four and a half minutes, and then the presentation would start. The room was silent. You could hear a pin drop. Everyone stopped looking at their phones. It changed the energy in the room. Everything slowed down. It was magical. I was just in India in November. And I decided to bring a bit of that experience with me today by ringing this bell to create a sense of brief calm and centering before I start my official talk. This chair affects your soul. Let that settle in a little bit. It might feel strange for me to say that something as common as a chair can impact what's been portrayed as the very essence of our time here on Earth and possibly beyond. What's the definition of soul? People get a little uneasy when you talk about the soul. The word soul conjures up topics like religion and spirituality it unabashedly aims to identify our core. It's also very loosely defined. Think to yourself for a second, what's the definition of a soul? It's a tough question, right? But what if we took a step back for a second, away from religion, away from all our preconceived notions of what a soul is? And what if we simply identified it as the truest form of ourselves. Our soul is who we are when we strip away all the stressors, all the anxiety, and everything else that goes that gets in the way of who we truly want to be. It's our most ideal self. I'm sure we'd all like to realize this version of ourselves and help our clients realize it too. But a lot of things go into whether we realize this version of ourselves. There are the actions we take, then there are the outside influences and how we respond to them. We like to think that we are in control of our responses, and we are, mostly, but only to a certain extent. 
See, not only do we have emotional responses to our outside influences, but we also have physiological ones. Take basic things like compassion, music, and laughter. Practicing compassion actually boosts our immune system. Music has been shown to improve our focus and laughter. Well, laughter triggers a reward center in our brain. If these outside influences can all have an effect on us, physiologically, and therefore on what we're calling our soul, then it follows that we should be cognizant of the outside influences that we let into our lives and into our clients' lives. We know this. We know this at a basic level. We try to choose water over soda, apples over cookies. We tend to avoid negative people. We work with people that inspire us. We prefer temperate climates over harsh ones. We make all of these choices in an effort to feel good and to do our best work and live our best lives. Why? Because it makes us feel good. These actions prompt the release of feel-good neurotransmitters into our brains and ultimately feed our soul. Dopamine is known as the feel-good transmitter. It is responsible for the feeling of pleasure and satisfaction. Serotonin regulates mood, social behavior, sleep, memory, and desire. Oxytocin has been called the love hormone and plays a major role in bonding and well-being. Lastly, endorphins, the stress fighters, they reduce stress, increase pleasure, and result in a boost to the immune system. But not all neurotransmitters have just positive effects on us. For example, cortisol, our body's main stress hormone, controls our mood, our motivation, and our fear. It comes from our body's fight or flight reactions. We were born with this. Now, I'm not going to give a college course on neurotransmitters today. That's my next talk. But it's here that science in our world, our world of beauty, design, working with extraordinary things, converge. And these neurotransmitters are inside all of us. And they are the foundation of everything that I'm talking about today. This balance of neurotransmitters affects how we respond to various situations. For example, we respond to differently to difficult situations when we're calm and relaxed, as opposed to anxious and on edge. Research has shown that people who are in stressful situations are more likely to favor the positive outcomes of an important decision than the negative ones. The environments that we create contribute to our state of mind. But some of us, not interior designers of course, have neglected to attend to this key feed, soul feeding area, our environment. We know on an unconscious level that certain places make us happy, and most of us know how to create those places. Alan de Botton wrote in The Architecture of Happiness about how walls, chairs, and floors can combine to create an atmosphere in which, in which the best sides of us are offered the opportunity to flourish. Think about it. We all have the places in our mind that stand out as the places that make us feel better, places that fill us with awe, that comfort us. Maybe it's a bluff looking out over a body of water sitting in a wonderful chair. Maybe it's in the living room with beautiful and comfortable furniture, colors that are soothing, gorgeous lighting and art sitting by the fireplace. The point is, we know how a space can make us fail, feel at a deep, much deeper level. And as humans, we've known this for a very long time. For instance, back in the 1950s, Jonas Salk was looking for a cure for polio in his cold and dark Pittsburgh basement. Frustrated by his progress, Salk escaped to Assisi, Italy, where he wandered around a 13th century monastery. Suddenly, he found himself coming up with all sorts of new ideas to try, including the one that eventually lead to the polio vaccine. Salk was so convinced that the serenity 
of the monastery helped him develop the vaccine that he solicited world-renowned architect Louis Kahn to help him develop the campus for the Salk Institute in the hopes that scientists could have similar experiences and that would lead to similar life-changing breakthroughs. Louis Kahn and Jonas Salk intuitively knew what sort of physiologic impact a building can hold. Since its creation, the scientists that work at the Salk Institute are still making major breakthroughs in cancer research and other medical research every day. What Salk didn't know at the time is that there's an actual scientific reason for why inspiring spaces often yield inspired ideas. A lot has changed since the Salk Institute was built in the 1960s. Research is underway to understand how our environment influences our brain chemistry, and the results are revealing. We know that light affects our creativity, material features impact our mood, and forms and furnishings connect us to our memories. We've all felt these facts on some level or another. We have our special working places, our relaxing places, and we create these places for our clients every day. As an interior designer, yes, for more than 30 years, <laughs> I've witnessed how design can have a profound effect on our physical and emotional state, on our soul. I have had clients tell me that they feel as though their home has become a sanctuary, away from the stressors of their very demanding work lives. I've had employees impacted by my design tell me that they feel more motivated in their workspace. I've had educators and students tell me that a once deserted lounge is now constantly full and has a completely renewed energy. Why? Many of us here know the answer to this. I will touch on just a few of these answers today. Basically, dim rooms help us feel more relaxed. Bright rooms combined with natural light improve our focus. Rooms with higher ceilings can promote abstract and creative thinking, while rooms with lower ceilings help us pay more attention to detail. This is known as the cathedral effect. Views and access to outside spaces can actually lower your heart rate. That means the work we do can actually maybe get people off blood pressure medicine. I think that's pretty amazing. <laughs> Round edges put us at ease and make us feel more comfortable, while sharp edges, they make a room feel a little less inviting, a little more edgy. Alzheimer's patients show fewer signs of aggression and anxiety when they're in private rooms surrounded by their own personal objects and memories. All of us here know that color impacts how we experience the space. It is truly one of the most important elements that we all use in our work. Color is a true game changer. Red helps us focus. It represents life vitality, and it symbolizes good fortune. And blue, blue helps us relax. It is serene and mentally calming and stimulates clear thought, stability, and productivity. I had a client once tell me, after we painted her master bedroom blue, which I had to talk her into, she was really nervous, that her bedroom relationship with her husband changed. She was so happy and could not believe how something as simple as painting her bedroom blue could change her marriage and her bedroom life in such a wonderful way. <laughs> it really, she really did. It, it gave me great joy <laughs> to know that I made her life better and happier. And I realized even more how, how much of an impact color has on our psychology, our well-being, our happiness, our life. <coughs> Once when I was at a meeting at an office space, a young software engineer came running up after me and said, did you help create this space? I said, yes, I'm kind of shy about that. I usually don't tell people who I am. <coughs> and, um, and he had told me he'd never felt this way at work. And he thanked me for changing how he experienced working in a space. He took me to coffee and asked me all kinds of questions about what details were done to create such a sense of well-being and energy. And you know, he's an engineer, so he's really curious. <laughs> I'm like, well, you know, I told them that all the details are what most of us designers do as tools, you know, things we use, so well-balanced spaces and daylight planes with outside views. 
in an engineering space, I usually do sit-stand desks because you need to move around. Um, natural light, access to nature, large windows, reclaimed wood, art, artisan elements, plants, colors that energize. He was so excited that he wrote an article about it for his colleagues in India. It made me realize again how the design we help create can have a local and global impact on people and that our work, our work that we do every day, has a ripple effect and creates happy lives, happier lives for many people and even people we don't even know. I have a client that is an ICU emergency room doctor at a really prominent local hospital. I've helped him with all of his homes. I was just finishing a project for him and doing the normal fluff and puff that uh, we all do as interior designers so that when your client arrives, everything's just perfect and it's all really, really pretty. When I greeted him outside his door, he was obviously very distressed. He had just lost a 16-year-old young man in the ICU, and his heart was very heavy. I quickly finished up and left him alone. About an hour later, he texted me and said, thank you. Thank you for creating a place for me where I can recharge and find peace that helps me to recover and be my best self. That text changed me it was an affirmation and reminder that the truest nature of being a designer is to improve the lives of others and to make spaces become sanctuaries. That message gave me a renewed sense of purpose in my design work. I was actually thinking of changing, leaving the profession for a while. And I'm like, no, that's a call to action. <laughs> I can't leave. But I have a responsibility to help create spaces like that for all my clients and to share this with others. I have also experienced the impact design can have on your soul firsthand. When I was diagnosed with cancer, I was absolutely terrified. I needed to know that my life and my work had a purpose. I questioned what my legacy would be if I was to die and not recover. If I was cured, I wanted the design work that I do to embody what I felt would create more health and well-being for people in their environments. If I was cured, I wanted the work I do and that I am actually so passionate about to change the world. And I started out on my journey on the soul of design and the neuroscience of beauty. When I was looking at my options for treatment, I instinctively knew that a sterile and antiseptic environment would not be conducive to my optimal healing and state of mind. I needed to be in an environment where I felt safe and that would inspire me and help take the fear out of my chemotherapy and further cancer treatments. I found a cancer center with natural daylight pouring in, views to nature in the sky above, healing gardens, art, soothing colors, and natural materials. These elements that have proven to help people be more receptive to healing and less afraid work for me, and I healed. During my recovery, I would often feel drawn to nature in places that gave me a greater sense of calm and peace and help me slow down. Many places like this are created very intentionally to give people a place to recharge, reflect, and to find the inner voice to be their best selves. Away from technology, immersed in natural materials, natural light, artisan created elements, art, and nature. I believe we, collectively, need to create more of these types of what I call gratitude and thanksgiving spaces in our lives and in the work that we do. A place without technology where we can reconnect with ourselves, our neurotransmitters, and find our truest self. 
Today, research backs what were just gut feelings a few years ago. More than 600 studies detailing how design can influence patient outcomes have been published. One study showed how heart surgery patients who were exposed to landscape scenes reported less anxiety, needed less pain medication, which I find incredible because, you know, we have an opioid epidemic in this country. Imagine if we can create environments where people don't need as much pain medication. That's, to me, really huge. Another study showed that even just three to five minutes of contact with nature can significantly decrease stress, reduce anger and fear, and increase pleasant feelings. This new information has changed how we design hospitals. Current hospital design standards now call for bigger windows, and more and more hospitals are adding therapeutic healing gardens to new and existing facilities. But why do we have to wait until we're sick to nourish our soul through design? If we nourish our soul through design, we might not get sick as often. When design helps to relieve stress, we can be healthier as a whole. Think about it this way. We eat on average three times a day. Maybe we exercise three times a week, at least in this area. Yet we spend vast amounts of time and energy learning what to eat and how to exercise in the hope that we'll improve our lives. Just as eating well and exercising often makes us healthier, our environments also have the same effect on us. We now have the science that tells us that we, designers, create spaces and environments that actually make our clients' lives better. Wouldn't it be great if we could find a way to make this accessible to all people on our planet, not just our clients? There isn't any time when you are not in an environment, you're in one right now, in fact, the amazing San Francisco Design Center. And we have treats for you and wine and there's beautiful art. It changes us. We're in this space, there's blossoms, we're in this gorgeous place surrounded by beautiful things made by some of the most incredible makers, really, in the country and the world. It's inspiring. This environment is influencing you on a basic physiological level and all of us as interior designers need to know about how these places affect us, our clients, our neurochemistry, our health, our happiness, and our souls. This isn't new thinking. The ancient Greeks created temples to expose patients to nature, music, and art to promote healing. Vatsu, a traditional Hindu system, which translates to the science of architecture, originated in India more than 5,000 years ago yet it contains principles that are still used today in modern design to assure that our environments have harmony and are optimized for the most beneficial use of space. In Silicon Valley, San Francisco, we are blessed to live in an environment of abundance and anything's possible. We pretty much, it's pretty amazing that we live in a place with the kind of thinkers and people and everybody who's around us. Really, it's limitless. We can create and do anything here. Yet in other parts of the US, and in most of the world, like over here in Mumbai, which is one of the largest slums in the world, whenever you fly in a Mumbai airport, it's right there. It's extraordinary. Um, a beautiful, transformative space is still seen as a bonus rather than a necessity. It's time as designers that we change that fact. Human needs, humans need places to reflect, to recharge, to energize, to calm, and to be inspired. It is also very important to me that I recharge, that I can do my best work, and to be as healthy moving forward in my life and present as possible in my everyday life. Some of the things that I do to create soul in my life and my work are, I have a bit of an obsessive, crazy passion to travel the world. It nourishes my soul and it keeps my mind and my heart open. I give back by giving my time and resources to organizations that create a true ripple effect through the greater good work that they do, both locally and globally. And then I do sometimes disappear, and I trek in remote places with majestic nature. If we're more calm, 
make better decisions and have more breakthroughs in certain types of environments. Wouldn't it make sense to create more of those types of environments? What if we intentionally designed our spaces to put scientists in the right frame of mind to create the next polio vaccine? What if we used our environments to heal all patients, not just to select few, faster and more naturally? What if we made sure that all of our clients' homes are their personal sanctuaries so they can recharge and be their truest and best selves in the world? Or what if we simply used our workspace to foster the kind of mentality that allows people to do their best work? If we did, what kind of ripple effect would that have on society as a whole? Imagine if we paid even more attention to how environments impact our souls. Imagine if we always had soul in design. Take this chair. Imagine if we consciously decided if this chair right here influences our souls for the better or for the worse. If not for ourselves, then for the people around us who will benefit from the people that we will become. Because just as compassion, music, and laughter influence us, so do our environments. And it's time to put the power they hold into our design work and into our lives. Thank you.